Good evening, everybody. My name is Markus Kra. I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute. And on behalf of LBI and the Center for Jewish History, I'm happy to welcome you to tonight's program, which sadly is very timely, as we all know. Um, I want to extend a particular warm welcome to Scott Miller, our speaker, who will share his remarks on the topic after the movie. He's come all the way from DC and uh, he's very much involved in the topic of the movie. So I look forward to hearing his remarks. As I mentioned, it is unfortunately very timely to show this movie um, tonight um, for two reasons. And actually one of them is encouraging. So you may have seen in the news that just this past Sunday, um, members of the Tree of Life congregation in Pittsburgh came together to break ground for a new Tree of Life building, including a memorial site and an education center on the history of anti-Semitism in America. Scott is very much involved in this, and I'm sure we are curious to hear what he has to say about this new chapter going forward, particularly as any project dealing with anti-Semitism these days has become so much more pressing and complicated recently, which brings me to the second and um, frustrating sad reason why the program is so timely. The obvious context is the dramatic increase in anti-Semitism worldwide, uh, including in the US, after the Hamas attack on Israel on October 7th and the Israeli response. I'm glad that we can show you this documentary tonight um, because like the Center for Jewish History, we at the Leo Beck Institute try to make a contribution to our collective efforts to deal with these topics intellectually, but also by creating space for discussions, hopefully also tonight, create a sense of community, and particularly in our case, by adding a historical perspective to the topic. <clears throat> you may know that LBI was founded almost 70 years ago in 1955 with a mission to preserve the history and culture of German-speaking Jews. We've been doing this by making our archives of millions of digitized pages of historical documents available to scholars, but also to wider audiences. Um, audiences which we invite to come to LBI, to our public programs, to lectures, to movie screenings, to our book club, um, to our exhibitions, and also to listen to our award-winning podcast, Exile, narrated by Mandy Patinkin, who brings to life the stories of German-speaking Jews in exile in North America and elsewhere. Um, we have understood this mission to include the entire length of about 1,700 years of Jewish history in German-speaking lands, which we refuse to let be reduced to just anti-Semitism, or for that matter, just to the Holocaust, just quote unquote. But of course, we feel obligated to show the relevance of this history to the present, to the American present in particular. So we want to provide space for debates on current topics like anti-Semitism by programs like the one tonight. But I also want to invite you to come back and explore the other programming that we offer after tonight's program. The documentary, which we will show in a minute, uh, is called A Tree of Life, the Pittsburgh Synagogue Shooting. It came out on HBO in 2022. I've seen it, and I'm sure that you will be as moved and inspired and interested in it. It runs for about an hour and 20 minutes, after which we will invite Scott to share his remarks and his perspective on the topic with us, and then there will be time for a Q&A and then we can continue the conversation outside at a reception. Thank you all for coming, um, and I hope you will maybe not enjoy, but find the movie interesting and inspiring. Thank you. Let us hear a little more about what we've seen um, to start a conversation by the remarks by Scott Miller, who I will introduce briefly as he suggested um, and then he will share his experience and expertise, which he has in, by his involvement in the Tree of Life um, community. Scott is a former director of curatorial affairs at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington and a current member of the Tree of Life Memorial Project, so he can speak to what has happened since the documentary came out 
and about the new chapter that uh, began symbolically last Sunday when um, members of the congregation broke ground for the new buildings which will be built on the site of the shooting. Scott, thank you very much for coming and thank you all for coming and for staying. And after Scott's remarks, there will be time for Q&A. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, um, thank you, and um, it's a great honor to be here at the Center for Jewish History, and I wanna thank the Leo Beck Institute for sponsoring this film. Uh, it's also a great honor to be uh, on the advisory board of the Tree of Life Project in Pittsburgh, which I will uh, talk about in a few minutes. Uh, the next chapter, uh, where we're going, how this is gonna be, the story is gonna be told and how it's gonna be memorialized. Um, but having said that, that now I'm with Tree of Life, I worked, I was at the Holocaust Museum in Washington for 30 years. I was there the year it opened, I was a founding staff member, and I still tend to see things through the lens of the Holocaust and the Holocaust Museum. And I'd like to make that connection here to uh, Tree of Life, a, a, a few things. Clearly, obviously, when I worked at the Holocaust Museum, I visited the sites of Auschwitz, and Treblinka, numerous concentration camps in Germany, and other massacre sites in Europe. But I went to the Tree of Life uh, in December of 2022, and nothing I saw in Europe prepared me emotionally for the Tree of Life. I'm not, of course, comparing what happened at the Tree of Life to the Holocaust. I'm just saying the, the, the freshness or the rawness of what I saw in Pittsburgh. Um, this is something that happened here on American soil in a lovely, very innocent looking neighborhood like Squirrel Hill if you've been there. And it happened to people who sort of look like me and sound like me, uh, you know, from, from the United States. And you, the, um, the actual, the sanctuary, which was still then, I still, it is, still is, but then it was a crime scene. So there were ropes around it, but nothing had changed. So you go in and you saw the bullet holes through the prayer books with the Sidurim and through the um, parochet, through the, um, on the uh, ark, the curtain of the ark. You saw the, uh, the blood stains and the, um, and the bullet holes. Not only that, when some people, congregants fled, they, they hid in these closets, um, in side rooms, and those closets had on them um, Ten Commandments that were made by children. They were on paper, they were asked to draw Hebrew school children. You know, if they were God, what would the Ten Commandments be? And every one of them had, you know, thou shall not kill. And they were the bullet holes around them. So this really affected me in a way uh, that was very, almost unexpected. Uh, but, the, but the other connection with these sites in Europe that actually is a commonality is that this, the Tree of Life, is a Jewish memorial site in the United States. There are not that many Jewish memorial sites in the, in the United States. Um, those are really, you think of those as being in Europe. When you go through the American South, you see a lot of sites of massacres and violence uh, against you know, African Americans. But this is a Jewish site of horror, of mass shooting here in, in Pittsburgh. So that was sort of a similarity with the Holocaust. And another, I, I would say, way in which I you know, looked at anti-Semitism, uh, even anti-Semitism in America was through my, the lens of the Holocaust and the Holocaust Museum, which um, was anti-Semitism was at a, I'm sure many of you know, um, was at its height in this country in the 1930s and the 1940s, really during the Holocaust. And that actually uh, affected, uh, the very, I would say, less than generous refugee policy that the American government enacted because of the high rate of anti-Semitism and high rate of disapproval of immigrants. You know, um, a month before the St. Louis set sail, there was a very famous Fortune magazine poll that over 80% of Americans uh, uh, thought that um, immigration restrictions should be even tighter. I bring this up just as a way to show that's the lens that I looked at anti-Semitism, how it affected the Holocaust. It wasn't so much about how it affected people here, it was how it affected uh, uh, the Holocaust. So I, I, I bring that up to show really how Tree of Life is in a certain way, um, 
a, a game changer. I also look at the world a lot through the lens of Israel. I lived in Israel for, before I worked at the Holocaust Museum, I lived in Israel for six years. And so of course, uh, October 7th changed things for everybody. In, in terms of Israel, in terms of anti-Semitism, college protests, and now people, we tend to uh, look at this era uh, as sort of also sadly a game changer in terms of American anti-Semitism. Uh, many, many of you have perhaps read the article uh, by uh, Franklin Four in the Atlantic, this you know, idea that we had a very good ride after World War II, and now the ride is ending. But what I would like to say is, let's go back from October 7th, 1923, to October 27th, 2018. It's almost five years to the day, just two weeks short of five years exactly <clears throat> between the Tree of Life shooting and October 7th. Uh, and, I, and I bring that up because the fifth anniversary of the Tree of Life was this past October, and people virtually didn't talk about it because it was right after October 7th. But I want to bring us back to Tree of Life to make the point that maybe, maybe the ride that we all thought we had wasn't as good as we had. And that in fact, um, what, what happened in Pittsburgh on October um, 27th, 2023, the Tree of Life shooting, was not the first, what? What did I say, 17? Yes, yeah, sorry. 2023 is October 7th. A lot of sevens here. Yeah, six and sevens. I apologize. But you know what I'm uh, talking about. Um, <clears throat> the um, Tree of Life was not the first synagogue shooting in the United States. Does anyone remember, or Jewish community shooting? It was the most lethal. Um, the most Jews were killed. But does anyone remember? Uh, I think it was 1999, a shooter went into a federation in Jewish day school in the Los Angeles area, wounded three people. In 2014, a shooter went into the JCC Federation building in suburban Kansas City in Overland Park, Kansas. Three people were killed. 2017, of course, Charlottesville, the march, Jews will not replace us, was before Tree of Life. So Tree of Life, though sadly, from the point of view of the killer, was the successful one. Um, but this should make us look back and try to trace the steps leading up to Tree of Life. And perhaps, as I said, maybe the ride was not as good as we had thought. Uh, yes, certainly there was optimism um, or hope. I wouldn't say optimism, but hope after the Holocaust. Certainly the, United, certainly the establishment of the State of Israel, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, their uh, the, the Genocide Convention outlawing genocide, this all, this all came out of the Holocaust. But in fact, anti-Semitism uh, persisted in the United States. And we don't want to separate, though anti-Semitism has unique characteristics, we don't want to separate it necessarily from um, just general xen xenophobia, anti-immigrant sentiment, racism, um, the shooter, the killer. And I too, like the person in the movie, don't really like to say the name, uh, the killer. Um, was not only in a, a, based on his uh, social media postings, was not only an about anti-Semite, was also uh, a, a xenophobe and railed against immigrants taking over the country. And in fact, the reason Tree of Life was chosen as the site of the killing, there are many synagogues in Squirrel Hill, but why that synagogue was because before that, and I believe it was in the movie, was uh, Tree of Life was participating in Refugee Shabbat. And also, Tree of Life was also a distribution center for clothes and uh, other materials um, to refugees. So in fact, what happened to Tree of Life wasn't just anti-Semitism, it was also an act of uh, uh, xenophobia. And many of the groups, the amazing groups in uh, Pittsburgh who reached out to the Jewish community were, them were themselves victims of um, uh, uh, racist violence. There was a Sikh, Sikh, Sikh community in, um, in, in Pittsburgh that reached out in a very active way to Tree of Life. And not long before that, there was a burning of the uh, um, Sikh um, place of worship, house of worship in Wisconsin. You may remember uh, less than a year after uh, the shooting in um, Tree of Life, there was a shooting in Poway in California. 
And so the shooter there, which was at a Chabad in Poway, California, uh, the shooter there had also um, tried to burn down a mosque uh, the week before. Um, so again, we're not necessarily separating anti-Semitism from racism, from uh, xenophobia. So the museum, what's gonna be built at the Tree of Life is, first of all, it's a memorial. No one is gonna to go to memorial to the Tree of Life without knowing what happened there, and it's gonna be very much in the spirit of the movie. It's gonna be about the 11 people who were killed. These were not only Jews who were killed, they were Jews who lived and had lives and had Jewish lives, and this is gonna be a, a tribute to their, uh, to their lives. And we'll tell the story, though, of what took place there. There will also be a um, museum, educational center and museum, and it will be the first museum in the United States that tells the story, the history of anti-Semitism in the United States. Not the way many of us, you know, I'm speaking for myself, grew up that, well, anti-Semitism in the United States may have existed, but certainly not as lethal as it was in Europe during the Holocaust or when my grandparents came over from Eastern Europe, they talked about the Tsar and Tsarist Russia, all true, but that's not doing justice to anti-Semitism here when you compare it to even a worse form of anti-Semitism. So this, the museum at Tree of Life will be a historical um, exhibit based on artifacts, film, documentary footage of the history of anti-Semitism in this country, um, beginning in the revolutionary, revolutionary, revolutionary era to the present with sort of this emphasis that um, America was, may have been different, but there was not the ride that, um, you know, that we, we thought that we had. Um, that might not sound like a very optimistic topic to talk about anti-Semitism. However, uh, the Museum uh, Education Center will end with the idea of resilience, both Jewish resilience, and as well as the resilience of what took place in Pittsburgh. It was genuinely beautiful what happened in Pittsburgh with the community reaching out, the general non-Jewish community of Pittsburgh reaching out. Um, and I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with, I'm surprised they didn't, I don't think they showed it in the film, uh, the um, Pittsburgh newspaper that that Friday after the killing had the um, Mourner's Kaddish in Hebrew, Yitgadal v'yitgadash um, it is the headline. It's really, you know, uh, ph phenomenal that, that humanity triumphs over hate. I mean, these sound like, you know, platitudes. Yeah, humanity tri triumphs over hate, but it, it was really true in Pittsburgh. So this exhibit will actually end on a hopeful uh, note. It'll t it's telling a, a dreadful story, but ending on a hopeful note. In part, I think that's an American, perhaps, um, phenomenon. Even, I mean, the Holocaust Museum also in the United States, in Washington, uh, does end in 1948, not in 1945, with the establishment of the State of Israel, hopeful note, and also the beginning of more liberal dis DP, the, the DP legislation, uh, which began in 1948, bringing, uh, allowing more Jewish dis uh, refugees to come to the United States. And then the, uh, the Hall of Remembrance at the Holocaust Museum, it's a skylight looking out to the sky of uh, Washington, uh, uh, D.C. So I think it's partially an American um, uh, perspective to uh, end in that type of uh, hope, but I think it really reflects what happened in Pittsburgh. And to a degree, it's a, a Pittsburgh, it, it's not, a Jewish Historical Society of Pittsburgh Museum, but there will be history also of, of Squirrel Hill to understand the vitality of a Jewish neighborhood and what ethnic neighborhoods are like in the United States, were and still like in the United States. And um, so it, it's, the museum is gonna be all of those and there's gonna be an educational center. Uh, Pittsburgh is a very um, culturally, ethnically diverse uh, city and there's gonna be a lot of um, educational programs dealing with um, diversity, tolerance, immigration, where people came from. Um, and we just, two weeks ago, we were very privileged. Uh, the Tree of Life um, had a mini exhibit in the Russell Senate Office Building, uh, in the, rot the little rotunda, if you've been there, in the, in the Russell Senate Office Building. That's very difficult real estate to get an exhibit in. Uh, 
and they can only be for five days. It was a lot of work for five days, but we had an exhibit, uh, a mini exhibit, um, and at the opening of the exhibit, of course, came um, Senator Fetterman, um, who would, if you, an amazing person, and actually, if you've seen photos of him, it's actually true that he wears a, a hoodie and gym shorts, that's how he came, uh, and also Senator Casey. Uh, Tree of Life has been blessed to get a lot of support from the um, state of Pennsylvania, also from Josh Shapiro, uh, the, the, um, the governor. Um, so I, I do want to leave time for uh, uh, questions. Um, Oh, do you want me? Oh, I'll call on people. Should I? Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Josh Shapiro was the attorney general at the time prosecuting before he became governor. I have a comment, uh, and uh, it sounds a little pessimistic, but I do want to follow up with a positive thought. As you were talking, I was thinking, you know, this event from five years ago, today, in today's world where we are today, it seems so quaint, you know? And, um, you know, what, what, what message do we take from this? You know, a hopeful message. And, and I realized as you continued speaking that the hopeful message is that we want others, we want ourselves and we want other Americans to see how people of different backgrounds come together and care about each other and that this um, rampage, well, it's one person, but, th but th this, this event of horror that inspired other murders need not be the focal point, but it's the coming together of Americans of different backgrounds yes. that should inspire us all how we can live together. Yes, absolutely. And just to, um, what you said beautifully, um, also, but, so, but, you know, you said some of this sounds quaint. I mean, what's happened in the last five months, let alone five years? Um, these are topics that Tree of Life will grapple with. It, it doesn't end, you know, on October 27th, 2018, of the, of the shooting of Tree of Life. It doesn't end not to speak of the Poway shooting afterwards and then the Jersey shooting, Jersey City shooting afterwards, et cetera, et cetera. But um, also with, in terms of uh, October 7th, an increase in um, hate crimes specifically against Jews after October 7th. There's a lot to grapple with. It's gonna be a very, it's like many of these museums dealing with topics of modern Jewish history, they're complicated. Um, and I would imagine there's also gonna be some type of the end, like every ex museum now, like an interactive learning center because two weeks after the museum opens, God forbid, but there could be another, you know, you know, event. We don't want to sound, we don't want the museum to sound quaint. So that was, you know, the point that I was trying to make is that what happened in Pittsburgh is part of this ride that wasn't so good that we thought <laughs> we may have had. Um, thank you, though. Yes. I get everyone. Thank you. Could you contextualize for us the current experience of anti-Semitic violence in the U.S.? Maybe at least on thinking in two contexts. The first is, I know that it's virtually impossible to enter a synagogue in Europe or in South America without not just you know getting checked out, someone greets you and sees, but even emailing and saying, "Hey, I'm going to show up," and they'll say, "Who? Who are you?" So mm -hmm. it's. It's a very tight security condition in other parts of the world, and I'm wondering how it compares to here and where, perhaps where we're going. Yeah. And second, um, you mentioned uh, anti-Semitism in the pre-World War II era, and I'm wondering, was there a lot of anti-Semitic violence as well? Like, what was the community feeling in the 30s? Okay, so to, um, your first question, um, there is definitely more security uh, in the United States, the synagogue. I live in Washington, D.C., so the synagogues, yes, even before October 7th, but it was strengthened after, um, bolstered after October 7th. Uh, there's, um, you know, an armed guard. 
you have to go through a metal detector so, um, to get into um, synagogues. It's, it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's very sad. You want a house of worship to be open. You think about, you know, churches can be open to homeless people and poor people, and it's not, you can't get in, you, you really uh, can't get in. Every, I, it's not the same everywhere in the United States. I can definitely speak for um, uh, Washington, and that it's definitely been uh, stepped up, and it, that's certainly going to increase, not only at synagogues, but at Jewish day schools, at JCCs. There's, I mean, it's like an airport. And I'll go also mention the Holocaust Museum in Washington, which always had more security uh, because it was a Jewish topic, even though it's a federal government museum, but it always had the most security of all the Smithsonian's, of all the federal government museums. But that in 2008, there was a shooter, uh, 2009 at the Holocaust Museum. This is a 90-year-old neo-Nazi, whose last name was um, uh, von Braun, who uh, shot to death uh, an African-American uh, security guard at the Holocaust Museum. Um, so security increased at the Holocaust Museum. Um, as someone who worked there, and there was no dispensation. If you, 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 you had an idea if you worked there, but you still had to go through security every time you would like leave the building for something. Um, it's, it's, so yes, it's, it's approaching Europe. So in terms of violence in the United States, yes, I mean, again, not to compare it to Europe, but there was um, certainly the, um, uh, the, the brutal beating up and lynching of, of, of Leo Frank. Uh, there's been, even in New York City in the 1930s, in neighborhoods in Brooklyn, um, mainly um, sort of in response to the uh, Spanish Civil War, there was even like sort of gang violence between um, some uh, Catholic teenagers and uh, beating up uh, uh, Jewish teenagers, um, and it, yes, it, it reared it, it reared its uh, ugly head before World War II and uh, after World War II, um, you know, as well. It wasn't the typical experience. The typical experience was more, um, you know, economic. The Jews were not, um, you know, Jews need not apply. Um, country clubs that had, um, this is right up until the 50s, um, you know, uh, Jews, blacks, and dogs cannot be members. Um, I mean, I remember my parents telling me this. It was, I grew up in the 1960s in New York. I, I didn't know if I realized that most people were not Jewish, but my parents like told me it was very hard to believe. Um, and that's not so long, you know, not so long ago. Um, Oh, yeah, I keep forgetting I'm the one. Yes. Thank you for being involved with a film that bears witness, because certainly Judaism and humanity, we are obligated morally, not only as Jews, but as humans, to bear witness. Can you speak a little bit about the reception of the film? Has it been shown publicly it, and distributed? It, it, it has been. I will just say that I was myself not been involved in the film. The film was separate from the Tree of Life organization. The, uh, the woman who made the film was actually in Pittsburgh that weekend visiting her family. She wasn't involved in, in, uh, in Tree of Life. But um, yes, I mean, it's been shown at the Capitol in the United States. Um, and yeah, it's been shown uh, both in you know not just like in Jewish film festivals, but all over the all over the country. But it 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 in being viewed by the public, let us say this group of the public here at this very special place. Yes, it yes. gives us an opportunity as humans to bear witness on the next level. So I feel very moved and absolutely. Very I know that. The film was very well received also because of personal stories. They were human stories. Yes, they happen to be Jewish stories, but these personal stories, like, I mean, the two brothers and, um, and the, the parents, you know. Uh, uh, yes, it was in that way, it was very well received as a universal story. I think it was very well done in that respect. And the, in, that, in that way, it's gonna be a model for Tree of Life, for the memorial and museum. The individual stories are, um, are going to be told. The first thing that people see, there's closer here, and, and then she's 
Oh, and then. What is going to happen to the original synagogue? Yeah, so um, the, act, the, 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 synagogue, the sanctuary is all actually, as of now, that remains. The rest of the building was actually knocked down, in part because it was actually going to be eventually knocked down for a newer structure. Um, but it also was not a fitting building to have a, for a memorial and to have an educational center. The synagogue's going to be there as a, as a, still as, as a, a synagogue. Um, they took a lot out, but a lot will be brought back in. I mean, even the, I'm not sure why, but even like the, um, and everything was done with such care, even like the stained glass was like taken out, but will be put back in. It's going to be a, a, a functioning synagogue with Shabbat services, um, and in part just and, and then we'll have, you know, brises and, you know, Jewish ritual and weddings. And in part, that will be, in a certain way, the statement in and of itself that it will, uh, of, of Jewish continuity and resilience. Um, but the rest, the rest of the area is going to be totally new, but the sanctuary will, will be there. So I really don't know how to frame this question. I live in Teaneck, New Jersey, and Teaneck has a very, a lot of Orthodox Jews and like 21 shuls and also a mosque. There is so much polarization in that town. There are people from outside of town who come in and demonstrate, sometimes violently. Where are we uh, talking, where are you? Teaneck, New Jersey. It's a oh, Teaneck. Near suburb of New York. And Teaneck prides itself in its diversity. It was the first town in, I don't know, in the country, certainly New Jersey, to voluntarily desegregate in like 1965 or so. So what I was thinking when I was watching the film, which was really well done, I felt like this is kind of like frozen. I feel like there's been a paradigm shift. The rabbis in Teaneck asked the imam if he would make a statement in support of Israel, no. Black people as well, black um, clergy people as well. We got one, um, and I, and there had there is definitely a lot of people, black and white, in Teaneck that are trying to reach out to each other and see each other as human beings. I feel like those people really don't need to do that because they're they don't they're already you know they're already like what you're trying to do. Um, but what I'm saying is is I feel like where I'm living is a microcosm of the country. And even though most people support Israel, there's so much anti-Semitism, like look at New York. But it, it's like, to me, there's like a paradigm shift. And I was wondering when I was watching the film, that lovely Muslim guy whose parents came from India or whatever, I'm wondering where he is like now in terms of supporting Jews and other people as well, because there isn't that in Tina. Well. Um, I mean, as I said before, I mean, the whole issue of post-October 7th and are the same people who came out who are supporting Jews who went through this terrible shooting, are they making statements for Israel? That's actually a great, that's actually a great question. Um, probably the answer is no. I mean, I don't know about, I'll be honest, Pittsburgh, I don't, because I don't, I'm not like living there right now. Um, but yeah, that's very, very, very good. Um, good question. Was there another? Oh. The film was really to the point, and I would like to respond to uh, what this woman right before me had to say, T-neck, um, and what you had to say as well. And you thought, oh, this is not, we see from, we see from this shooting that it's not the uh, free for Jews world that we thought we were living in. You said that in different ways many times. Let me say that I grew up in the town next to Teaneck, Dumont. And every time you said, oh, we thought it was such an un, anti-Semitic world in this country, 
We thought. Yes, we did. No, you thought. Yes, I, growing up. I, yes. You thought that growing up. I got beaten up on the way to school every day. Every day. Mm-hmm. Not, and violently, I don't mean just taunts. Right. I mean physically. And that is very close to New York City. Oh, of course. So all of this, you know, and, and I am also the child of Holocaust survivors. All of this was never a shock to anybody in my family. This is not, it's not a different world than we thought we were growing up in. And I, I think that it's time for Jews to wake up and to know what other people are thinking. And like this gentleman said, we should use this. We, we're doing a really terrible job of educating other Jews and Americans who we are. We, there's, we have no propaganda. As a matter of fact, we say, oh, we're surprised this is going on. We were surprised by October 7th. Hello? I think it's time for us to re-examine ourselves. It was, should not have been a surprise. No. Sorry if that sounds harsh. Correct. I could talk to you afterwards if you just have one more question. Yes. Uh, Yes, so I wanted to ask about um, how, and I mean, the sense of community was just so tangible in this film, Um, but I wanted to ask um, how, uh, if you could perhaps contextualize it a bit, how are Jews and sort of our American Jews in our contemporary era, where, where are these places of community that, you know, they are seeking, where they are rallying at or, or gathering at, of course, you know, in the 20s to 60s, we had the Borscht Belt and, you know, that was a refuge for, you know, Jews who were, you know, denied, you know, resorts and hotels and so forth. But where are Jews going now? And how does that relate to these, you know, sort of broader uh, coalitions that American Jews are forming with other communities, other, you know, historically marginalized communities? Yeah, I mean, look, there are, including Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh, where the shooting was, there are very, very robust Jewish communities, I mean, around around the country. Um, you're, you're sitting in, yeah, right, you're sitting, you're, I mean, you're sitting in now, but with T-neck and, um, but none of, it's not, I mean, I'm not sure, I mean, it's not going to prevent anti-Semitism, but. Um, I, but there's, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of robust, um, you know, Jew, Jewish centers, um, not just New York. New York might be the, it's New York, but, um, and I see even, I've lived in Washington, D.C. now, like around 30 years and I see the difference. It's become so much the Jewish community in the city of Washington. I'm not talking about the suburb, the Jewish, the quote unquote Jewish suburbs. The city, the District of Columbia. The Jewish community has become so much more vibrant um, in terms of uh, synagogues, minions that aren't synagogues, the, a brand new JCC, a brand new uh, Jewish day school. I mean, it's it's almost unrecognizable from th- from 30 years ago. Yet, you know, I walk out of my house and uh, everywhere, um, you know, you see free Palestine, Jews committing genocide, Jews are, you know, Jews are baby killers. And I live right near the Israeli embassy. So I see it all the time there, but it's not just there. So in the midst of this really vibrant and young Jewish community, it's getting younger and younger, um, is you just see visually such, you know, this, this, this hatred. Um, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Scott, for your remarks and for helping us talk and think this through. I think it's it's very difficult to have, those conversations are very hard, and it's very difficult to have a conversation that does not leave at least 
parts of the group dissatisfied with what has been said and with the answers and the questions. Um, I think this is the nature of the situation right now. I'm glad that we can have those conversations here at the Center for Jewish History as a place where we can have them um, in a safe way and in a respectful way. So thank you all for contributing to this. And we can continue the conversation at the reception outside in the Great Hall. Thank you again, Scott, and thank you all for coming.